All right, so I'm Brian Curtin. I work for Rackspace. Uh, I'm a software engineer in the developer relations group. So that means I basically work for all of you. Um, we work for our customers. I'm the kind of uh, one of the Python guys when people have SDK problems, whether they're with Pyrax or LibCloud, or if you're a Ruby person, you use Fog or JClouds in Java. We're the team that kind of works with you. Um, and when I saw an opportunity to present to Chippy, once again, I, fig I figured I'd just start a new job. I've been doing new stuff, um, getting involved with uh, a little bit with OpenStack, using Rackspace. So I figured I would share with you kind of how to get going with Rackspace, especially uh, towards then I talked about two new features we just released um, in Pyrax that are for cloud monitoring and auto scale. Um, and I'm trying a new thing called don't write any slides at all. Um, this is all code and command prompt and stuff like that. Uh, it is also kind of a live demo that's not really a live demo because I ran the demo about 20 minutes ago um, just to make sure it works. So I am going to show a couple things to prove that these servers are actually running. It's not just a stream of animated GIFs that looks like um, technology. Um, so. Anyone familiar with, or I guess, is anyone a Rackspace user? All right, a couple people. Cool. Um, anyone familiar with OpenStack? All right, so the Rackspace cloud is built on OpenStack. Um, so that makes it uh, pretty easy to work with in terms of uh, an SDK pers perspective because Pyrax, which is the Python Rackspace API, uh, a number of its you know, parts are built on top, directly on top of Rackspace clients. So the servers is built on top of, uh, or cloud servers in Pyrex is built on top of Nova clients. Swift client, the same thing for cloud files. Uh, so kind of getting involved with it was, was, was pretty easy to get, to get started. Um, if you're a new customer to Rackspace, which you could potentially be because we just announced a new uh, developer tier, which gives you $50 a month for six months to kind of try out Rackspace and see how it works. Uh, if you happen to do that, this might be helpful in, in getting started. So if you're going to start on a new cloud platform, you might want to start by adding a server. Um, that's probably the, the most basic thing. Um, very simply, um, so Pyrax, it's, some of these are kind of long imports. Uh, CS so equals Pyrex.cloud servers. So once I've authenticated, I can now start up cloud servers. Um, the first thing, you know, very, it's pretty simple API. Um, server, cloud servers dot servers dot create, give it a name, an image, a flavor, and there's a bunch of other optional things. I'm going to work backwards a little bit here. So you need to create uh, a server based on an image. An image is actually, um, what you might call a flavor. Uh, images are actually the, uh, uh, like the disk image in a way. So there are a bunch of uh, ones that Rackspace provides, various flavors of uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat. Uh, a couple other things in there, Debian, Arch. There's a number of Windows servers in there. Um, so you would pick, uh, you could very simply just images that list will iterate a list of the different types of servers. So for my for my demos, I just use uh, Ubuntu 1204. Um, that happens to be one of the quicker ones to create, uh, just for demo purposes. But your your image is your like disk image, and then a flavor is a combination. Another kind of poor naming choice, but we're kind of stuck with it. Uh, a flavor is your combination of RAM and disk. The smallest ones, 512 megs, and with uh, I think it's a 20 gig disk. Um, so I had a little script that goes through and it creates, it just kind of iterates through this stuff and makes little menus. So I picked the 1204 box with 512 links of RAM and I, uh, now I'm going to mess this up on my live demo. Um, oh, so the, the other option. So I, I've picked my, my disk image, I've picked my, basically the size of my machine. Um, of the other options, you can put, you know, there are a couple like default files you can throw on there. Uh, key pairing is something, one of the more common things to, to start up with. Um, so I have, before I've done this, I've actually ran 
uh, cloud server dot key pairs dot create. I created a name, my main key, and then I gave it the key. So now when I create this server, it's I'm going to call it. Uh, I forget what I called it. Let's see. Oh, I called it Chippy Server. So I created two of them. They're called Chippy Server. They're just it gives it a timestamp name. Uh, Chippy server, and I, I paired it up with my key, so now I have a box that I can SSH to, and I already did. And both of them are, are currently behind the load balancer, which I created very simply by creating nodes based on the uh, uh, the servers. So I gave it this little command command line prompt has takes different servers, iterates through them, creates a load balancer node, adds them to a load balancer. Um, what you do with load balancer creates again you give it a little name set up the port this is their little web server so their port 80 http protocol there are a number of different protocols you could create load balancers for if you're doing email stuff there's all different pop smtp whatnot uh, mysql give it the list of nodes that i want on my load balancer uh, create a virtual ip for it and then algorithm there are a number of algorithms that you could do with this um, Round Robin is the most simple one to demo, which I'm going to show right now, rather than doing weighted this and that. Um, I can't remember the. If I had slides, I would obviously know these. I'll not have to think of them. <laughs> That's the immediate downside of no slide talks. Um, anyways, they're, they're the standard load balancer types, uh, but Round Robin is the one I choose here. So I just create a load balancer. Those two servers that I created are now behind it. Um, let me get back to this. So here's the, the two that I created. Oh, blue, these little blue guys. And I can open them up. There, it works. Server one, server two. And to prove that this is, oh, SSH just died, oh. Caps lock. All caps, man. I'm totally. It's the worst live demo ever. There we go. I can type. Yay! Best meeting ever. So, um, that's the very easy part: uh, deploying servers and throwing behind a load balancer and SSH to them. It's pretty easy. Uh, I suspect that's pretty easy in a lot of different providers, but uh, that's how we get started. Um, So if you're going to you know, if you're going to be using Rackspace, you're probably going to be deploying some awesome web app. Um, I had like the best web app idea ever, and it's called Bike Shed as a Service. So who has arguments at work where you paint the bike shed? And you can never really figure out like what color to paint the bike shed. So I made a very simple um, REST API that helps you figure out what what color the bike shed should be, and what better place to put it than than a Rackspace server. Um, not really a web person. I, if you guys know, I used to work in trading, so the internet is new to me. Um, <laughs> this is, this is, besides editing those HTML files, which I stumbled through, this is like the most web thing I've done. Uh, very simply, it just creates random RGB values and then creates their hex variant and returns you a little JSON that has a hex color code with the RGB equivalent. And so I deployed that to my my Rackspace server, but since it's so popular and this is such an awesome app, like I just couldn't handle it. So I had to had to do a little monitoring, a little auto scale. Thankfully, we just came up with those features. So <laughs> it's just in time, just in time for this meeting. We came up with them. So let me find. Oh, monitoring right in front of me. So now that I have these 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 servers. Um, I'm going to set up some monitoring on them so I know when they're working, when they're not working, what's happening with them. Um, there are a number of different kind of types of checks. So there are, let me step back for a second. So in, in Rackspace Cloud Monitoring, you have there are a couple different kind of terms. You have an entity, which is one's a server. It could be a specific part of the server. It could be um, your web server, it could be a database on the server, it could be any number of things, but you have your entity, then you create a check, which is 
a type of check. It does something looking at that entity. Uh, you have a notification, which is like an email posting to a, a webhook or something like that. Notification plan, which is a series of notifications for different types. And then you create alarms, which when they check on that server, they gather certain metrics and they see if it's within certain tolerances that you specify in a little uh, DSL. So first thing is to get my entities, and I because I already ran this, I'm not, um, I already had a bunch of entities created. I'm going to use this, point it to the the original bike shed server, the one that was just being bombarded by Hacker News and Twitter and everyone. Um, so I have an entity that's my my that one web server. I'm going to create um, a check on it, and it's a remote.http check. So it's going to go and check my um, the bike shed as a service. It's going to try to get a color and see what happens. Does it get request? every minute and there's a 10 second timeout and it's going to check this um, so there are different monitor monitoring zones there are the different data centers that Rackspace has so I'm going to actually so this is deployed in the ORD data center Chicago which is actually in Elk Grove Village they're not going to name it Elk Grove Village obviously um, <laughs> the, but I want to I want to make sure you know in the interest of uh, Availability, you know, check it from outside. You can actually give it multiple, so I could have it check from uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. I could have it check from London, Sydney, uh, outside of DC. They're all airport codes, actually. IAD, IAD is the Dallas airport. Um, and then I'm going to give it an alias. So in my entity, there's a, a number of networking things set up. Um, access IP one v four is that that interface on that entity. So my check is going to make some HTTP check on my API and, and see that it's up every minute. I'm going to create a little notification that will email me um, when anything changes. Uh, by itself, this is just a kind of bare, tell me to you know, email me something. And I just set up my email there. And then you, the, the next part is to create a notification plan. So when my check goes into OK state, it'll email me. When it goes in the warning state, it'll email me. When it goes in the critical, it'll also email me. It's a very simple demo. If you had different, you know, if it's okay, you might want it to do something different than critical, you know, or email different people, but for this purpose, I just email myself each time. And then the real, uh, the real guts is in the alarm. So I'm gonna, using all that stuff to contact me and what to check, I am going to, I'm going to uh, create an alarm that uses accesses my entity with that check, given that notification plan, see if, uh, it's, it's fairly readable, the little DSL, if the metric called code, which is the uh, HTTP response code, is a 500 return and that it's critical. You probably would have done something, you know, that's kind of like a, the last ditch effort. It was easiest for me in this little demo because I just shut the server down, it gets a 500, it creates more stuff, which you'll see later. Um, there are any number of things you could be checking here. Um, with HTTP stuff, you could be checking how much data it gets back, response time, stuff like that. So you could take more proactive things than waiting until at 500s. But uh, for demo purposes, it works nice. So I've created this alarm that notifies me, and it did notify me a number of times, if I can find my email. Yeah. So I got these emails that said it's okay. This is like a little, I guess I could have put a more friendly name. Uh, oh, Chippy Check does a remote HTTP. Said it was good. A couple more times, good. There's a couple other ones in here where I, th th these are the coming back from when it was bad. Uh, oh, here's one. So everything's bad. Oh, it's, it's down, connection refused. Then I reset, so this is at 4.30. Then a couple of minutes later, I reboot the server. It came back up that it's okay. So very simply was alerted that something went wrong. Now I know something is good. Um, to take it a step further, you know, instead of emailing me that something is bad, um, why wouldn't it just take care of that itself? Uh, in my one server, um, you know, my, my own personal cloud of that one server, if that goes down, and it just emails me, and I'm sitting here on the couch at Chippy, like, what am I gonna do about that? Um, that's where autoscale comes into play. Um, autoscale is a new feature for uh, Rackspace. 
it operates kind of in the same way, but rather than emailing you, it calls a webhook, or it can call a webhook that will operate on a scaling group and kind of add and remove servers as, as things occur. So let me switch to another file here. So we have another a little demo. Um, Autoscale script. So Autoscale operates on what are called scaling groups. Um, you create a bunch of different uh, parameters I'll go through here. But effectively, I, I have my load balancer. So right now, I have that one server behind a load balancer that is load balancing one server. Um, shouldn't go down, but when everyone just crushes one server, everything goes wrong. So I tell um, Autoscale to use that load balancer, and then I create a minimum. And remember, entities are some server, some some piece of hardware, or really you know, cloud hardware. Uh, when this when this scaling group commences, it will create at least two servers. Depending on things, it could create up to four. How things are going? Uh, launch config type. This there's this is the default right now is just launch server. It'll launch a server. It could do other things in the future. Um, not exactly sure. Uh, flavor again. This is that kind of combination of RAM and disk. Um, I just hard coded. I know the I, the idea is too. You would really do it by iterating flavors and picking one and stuff like that. So I'm going to create a 512 server with an image. And so this image, this big long uh, grid, is that one server that I created, I've created an image of it. So it's that snapshot of that in time. But what Autoscale will then do when my alarm gets triggered that says when my uh, response code is 500, it will call a webhook that will then, you know, active, I think it's, maybe activates the right term, activate this scaling group that will add servers based on the image that I had already created to that load balancer. So it starts with two. So when everything goes wrong and my server goes down, I'm going to add two more of them to my load balancer to kind of make up slack, and then all of a sudden everyone can be painting the bike shed again. Um, it prefixes them with, you know, a string that you want. It's going to be bike shed dash some big long character string. Um, and then, so I've created a group that basically says add a, add a couple servers to my load balancer, and I add a policy that says. Uh, Let's, let's work with it via a webhook. Um, there's a concept in here of cooldowns also. So if my server is down and I have those checks happening really fast, if it keeps saying it's down, it's down, it's down, I don't want to just constantly, if I know it's down, I want to go you know, deploy my servers and get stuff going. I know it's going to take time to go. So I, I, you kind of cool down. So once you accept that something is going wrong, now you deploy your servers, you get everything going, and you kind of ignore things for a little bit. Let it, let your let yourself kind of you know catch up. So let your you know your two or four or whatever servers get going, get operational, and then I have it for 120 seconds. So two minutes later, if it's still wrong, then we'll you know reevaluate it rather than every 10 seconds just keep pounding, just basically just running money out of your pocket, just constantly just jacking up servers. Um, so this, th with the policy, it'll call a webhook. Um, maximum every 60, 60 seconds, it'll accept that. Um, and then this execute policy thing, I'm actually not 100% sure if this is necessary. So I've kind of just been toying around this recently. Um, Autoscale is actually not generally available. It's like an internal uh, access thing. Very soon uh, it should be available, but in the course of kind of toying with a demo, uh, I added this. It worked. It didn't break anything. But basically, I just say, execute my policy. Put it in play. Um, that may or may not be necessary, though. So you might want to forget about this and see. So what we have is, so I used to have just that one server. And now, if I can find the right tab, not that one, not that one. Here we go. OK. So here's my control panel. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Oh. So server one was my original, the lonely server that the image was created on. Um, 
when it uh, when Hacker News and Twitter and Reddit were bombarding it, the alarm that I had set triggered and said, "Hey, we need more servers." So it went ahead and it added bike shed, big long number, another bike shed. So they added three more servers. So now I have this load balancer that is kind of in front of four servers now, and run it a bunch of times. It's all back and operational. Got all these different colors. There's that. If you're ever on your phone and you need to get the bike shed, it's like crazy green. <laughs> um, really, if you ever need it, bike shed.io slash API slash v1.0 slash color returns the, the JSON uh, hex and RGB that populate this. Um, so, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I was going to talk about. Yeah, so we showed how to kind of create servers, how to add different things to them. Oh, one thing I kind of glanced over, the, um, I was going to show, there was a very simple DNS thing, but I'm not going to buy a domain, just a demo for this. Um, through the, the Pyrex APIs, you can also do things like set up, so once you've created your server, you can add to a load balancer, you can add DNS, you can do, uh, what else does we have? Oh, uh, block storage, there's basically anything that's in this control panel is mostly in there. Uh, you can create images, you can do uh, block storage, the uh, regular cloud files, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's, it's all on, uh, so if you're using Rackspace and you wanted to use this, it's on PyPy, or Alex Gainer's gonna kill me for that. PYPI, package index. Um, 1.5.0 is the latest one, just depends on a couple OpenStack clients, um, and it actually, uh, the one thing I was gonna mention, uh, like all of the SDKs that we, we work on at Rackspace, they are OpenStack first. Um, before we add Rackspace support, we make sure that it supports the underlying parts of, of Rackspace. So Pyrax um, is actually an OpenStack client that also works with Rackspace. It's developed by Rackspace people, um, but at the, at the core of it is a Rackspace client. And the same thing with LibCloud. LibCloud is a multi-provider uh, Python library, and obviously it supports a number of other things, but uh, the things that we're trying to add to it that are for Rackspace support, we're gonna be adding OpenStack first. So you'll be able to take your, your code with you, whatever you know, provider you end up going, you know, if you move around or you can, you know, especially with LibCloud, if you want to do things on Amazon and Rackspace at the same time and also whatever other things, it's you know a nice way to do it. But uh, yeah, I guess anyone have any questions? Questions? In the beginning, uh, you mentioned something about uh, a developer promotion. Can you go into that a bit? Yes, I can. Um, developer.rackspace.com slash dev trial. So we just added this, um, uh, let me step back for a second. So we had, for a while, we were we had these coupons that would give people, or projects, or you know whatever, um, basically a coupon for, for some amount, I can't remember what it was, some amount of uh, basically free Rackspace credit. So open source projects, or you know user groups, or whatever, would say, hey, here's, I think it was a couple hundred bucks go build awesome stuff and use Rackspace. So this was you know, projects that were building, um, projects that needed like continuous integration servers, stuff or you know, a new website. Um, we would offer them kind of a coupon and say, hey, you know, go ahead, throw it on Rackspace effectively for free. You know, to you know, make a build server, you don't need something crazy, you just, you know, just runs tests. Um, we got rid of that program and instead just made it open for everybody. Um, so if, if you go right now, you could create this account for, it's, I, yeah, it's $50 a month for six months. You have to give a credit card because if any over that, you gotta pay for it. But it's kind of a way to dive in and check out Rackspace and you, Okay, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's just a way to, here, I don't even need this anymore. Do you wanna just plug it in? Okay, uh, yeah, so it's just a way to kind of test it out, get acquainted, because we want, you know, we want developers to try it out. We want, you know, we're putting all these SDKs out there. We, we love developers. We love to have everyone in this room try it out. Uh, let us know good or bad, what you like about Rackspace. You know, try your apps, try whatever, and 